All right, uh, we, we're gonna start the session. Thank you everyone for joining the Software Testing One session. My name is Ajita, I'll be the session chair. We're also joined by uh, the student uh, chair for the session, Guilia. Am I saying it right? Okay, uh, so in this, in this session, we have uh, six papers and um, the format of the session will be that the papers will be presented for five minutes and back to back. So we will have uh, uh, no questions in the first half an hour of back to back presentations. And after that, uh, we will throw the floor open for questions and it will be in the format of a discussion. The presenters are also encouraged to ask questions about the papers to each other um, and um, just for the presenters, I will issue a warning in the chat window when you reach four minutes. Uh, so do keep an eye on that and feel free to chat um, as the presentations go as well. And we can pick up the questions after and uh, I can go through the order of questions. Thank you, everyone. So the first paper in the session uh, will be presented by David Falesi, Falesi uh, and uh, the paper topic is the impact of dormant defects on defect prediction, a study of 19 Apache projects. All right. All right. So thank you very much uh, for the introduction. So I'm not going to repeat uh, the title of this paper. This paper has been developed by me, my master's student uh, Alok at the California Wolverine State University and my colleague uh, Massimiliano Di Penta at the University of Sanio. So uh, this paper is about the dormant defect and the dormant, also called a sleeping defect, is a defect that uh, is not found yet. So it's a, sleep, it's a defect that sleeps over different uh, releases. And the class has a noise that we call snoring under two conditions. First, it has to contain at least one dormant defect and second, it is labeled while all containing defects are still dormant. So now let's have an example so that uh, we can understand uh, what is going on. Suppose we have a class, in this case, we call it class two, and we have three releases, release one, release two, release three, and we want to label the status of class two and release one. So we want to know if release, uh, if class two and release one is defective or not defective. Now, if we are in release two, so if we are here, we can see that uh, class two and release one has an injection, in release two has nothing, and release three had a fix. But if we run the label while we are at release two, we cannot know the injection because at release two we don't have yet a fix. So if we label class two and release one, we will label class two as non defective. Whereas if we label the same class two while we are at least three, we at least three, we will know about the fix. So when we label class two in release one, we will label this as defective. So again, I want to stress this message. When we label entities over releases, the same entity in the same release can change the status according to when we were formed the labeling. And so the labeling time impacts the presence of snoring. Uh, the aim of this paper is to know and inhibit the negative impact of snoring on defect prediction. We have two research questions. The first is, uh, does snoring reduce defect prediction performance? And the second is, does defect prediction performance improve if we remove from the training set the classes that are labeled as non-defective in the last releases? Now, due to time constraints, I prefer not to go into details in the second research questions, but to present the first research question only. This is the design of the validation. This is the most important slide of this presentation. So what happens is that when you use different prediction, we, use, we have a training set and sometimes we have a testing set if this is a validation. Otherwise, in practice, we have a training set. So in any case, we have a training set. And the point here is that if we label the same training set at different points of time, the training set changes values. 
And so if these values changes, now the conjecture is that these changed values can impact the accuracy of our defects. So to analyze this risk question, so to understand the impact of this noise in the data set to defect prediction, we have organized data according to releases. And uh, we labeled the same training set in two different points of time. The first point of time is at the very end of the project. And the second point of time is at the 33% of the project. Then we wasted the last half of the releases. And this because in these releases, we don't know if we have noise or not. So in order to achieve, uh, to limit the threat validity, we removed the last half of the releases. Now we have two training sets. The first training set, we call it with snoring noise. The second training set is without noise. And we have the same testing set. Then we measure the accuracy. And here you can see the loss in accuracy. So how much we lose when we have a training set with snoring. And we can see that in average, we try different classifiers, different projects, and so on. We can see that in average, we lose about 45% of our precision when we have snoring. We can see that the recall, the median recall is to reduce it by 90%, okay, and so on. Again, this reduction is not by having a different data set, by having a different training set. It's the same training set, it's just labeled at a different point of time, okay? So in conclusion, in research question one, we show that the presence of snoring decreases the recall of different prediction classifiers while not significantly affecting precision. And so researchers start consider neglecting the last half of data when validating prediction models. And the second research question that I've not presented, the results show that removing non-defective data from the last release significantly improved the classifier's performance. So practitioners shall consider removing from the training set the classes that are labeled as non-defective. So thanks a lot. Thanks, David, for keeping to time. Well done. Uh, so the next paper we have, uh, we have the, the next paper is MOOC testing for machine learning, simple tests to discover severe defects. Uh, and the presenter is Stefan Herbold. Stefan, if you want to share your screen. Yeah, mm. we can see it. Okay, thank you for the introduction. So our paper is, as was already mentioned about smoke testing and uh, how we found relatively severe defects with almost nothing. Um, so this is journal first paper, you can find it in Imperial Software Engineering. And um, yeah, due to time constraints, really quick, what is this about? Um, it's about testing machine learning software. So not some machine learning model like uh, we've seen before, performance testing of a defect prediction model, but rather testing whether these libraries like scikit-learn, Apache Spark, Weka, and so on work correctly. And smoke testing, as defined by the ISTQB, is a test suite that covers the main functionality of a component or system to determine whether it works properly before plan testing begins. So we're talking about really basic testing, nothing fancy. So um, our simple interpretation is that of this is cru crucial functions shouldn't crash. If we have a simple way to crash crucial functions, we probably have more important worries. So what are crucial functions when we consider machine learning libraries? Well, we have our normal workflow, right? We train uh, our learning algorithm with some data, get some models, throwing test data, and then evaluate. Basically, this is what we want to work. So with any data, we should be able to train and fit our model, and we should be able to run predictions. So in the end, these are the two crucial functions we're testing. Can we train and can we predict? Or can we make the libraries crash here? And our approach was, let's use a simple approach. Let's use something from a textbook. So something like equivalence classes. So the problem is with equivalence classes, you partition your input space. So what could this look like for machine learning? Well, we can more or less support any numeric data, more or less support any categorical data, and more or less any combination of those. So more or less all data. So there are no real equivalence classes here. Um, so this is quite annoying. So we thought, okay, boundary value analysis and a good way to derive test values. So if we look at the boundaries of this, yeah, we get extreme values at the machine precision, but that's it. So again, didn't really work. So we considered what does machine learning really work with? And it works with um, distributions. So instead we said, let's look at corner cases and extreme distributions and say, these are boundaries. 
inside, let's say, the valid space. And for example, we then had our equivalence classes. So technically, all of these should be working equivalent. Like you have very simple uniform data. That's really basic. Everybody should be work, able to work with that. But we can also take uniform data, but between zero and uh, 10 to the power of 16. So that's more or less machine, uh, the machine precision of max double. So extremely large values or extremely small values, still uniform, but with an extreme distribution or all values are zero. We have extreme left skew in the data. We have very, very strong outliers. We just split our training and test data and have no overlaps and so on and so on. We then used these simple tests and um, defined overall 22 of them and just tested all standard clustering classification algorithms of scikit-learn, Wecker, and Apache Spark with the latest releases at that time. And we found bugs. And the by far most efficient approach was just throwing data close to machine precision. We had stack overflows and out of memory errors in Wecker. We had memory errors in scikit-learn. We had a legal number of clusters in Wecker and so on. So really severe errors that can, can crash whole uh, virtual machines. And um, also interestingly, we also sweeped the hyperparameters of that, of these algorithms. And sometimes we found these bugs only for a single hyperparameter settings among hundreds. And the other tests were also quite effective. So for example, with inputting all zeros, we could crash the nearest centroid classifier of scikit-learn. With just inputting data from a single class, we could crash naive base with um, mm -hmm. just using a lot of different categories. We could crash the Bayesian network of Wecker and a lot of more minor mistakes. Once we found the mistakes, we went to the developers. So we basically wrote up the issues, then we sent them to the mailing lists or issue trackers, and the developers reacted. Um, so scikit-learn, they by now um, have more or less fixed everything. Um, another is in work because they actually split up this fix over multiple fixes. Um, with Weka, they said, okay, we're in deep maintenance mode. If you send us patches, we will merge them, but we won't do it ourselves. And with Apache Spark, they said, okay, this is a bug, but this is such an extreme case. We're a big data framework. We don't care about that. So what are the key messages? Um, before you go to advanced testing, really do your work on basic testing. Keep it simple. So these simple tests work. We found severe bugs. And when you do this testing, do not forget the hyperparameters. If you just take the default, you will miss bugs. Okay, then, uh, thank you. Um, so we're considering testing from a, let's say, a traditional testing perspective, not the let's look at accuracy. And um, we showed that with very simple stuff, we can find defects. We talked about it as a uh, fuzzy quality podcast, if you're interested in that. Um, yeah, and uh, I think I kept the time. And uh, yeah, yes, thank you. Yes, you did. For thank you. You were bang on time. Thank you, Stefan. Uh, the next paper is RNN test towards adversarial testing for recurrent neural network systems, presented by Jin Min Gu. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, I will introduce our TSC work for you. It's RNN test. As we all know, deep learning can be easily fooled, just like these adversarial examples, and the deep learning testing is quite challenging. As for existing testing methods, they mainly focus on CNNs and image classification. There are a huge gap between CNNs and RNNs in, in model structures, tasks, and other aspects. Uh, and so in testing methods and uh, coverage criteria for CNNs are hard for, to fit for RNNs. And for recurrent neural network, it's not a feed-forward structure. RNN models will iteratively make predictions given inputs. Uh, RNN includes three key components, hidden state H, self state C, and gates. Uh, for different RNN models, they are of this similar structure, while only LSTM models have cell states. The main difference of RNN models is the cell. Our LSTM and GRU introduce multiple gates for keeping contact information and become mainstream RNA models. Now we show the flow of our work. Uh, given uh, original in test input, the first step is to extract all the hidden states and cell states of each RNA cell. These states are then for the joint op optimization. 
the first part uh, purposely violates inner dep dependencies of RNA states to lead the model to give wrong predictions. The second part is tries to cover more states to exercise more logics. Then it will be solved in a gradient way to get perturbations. Uh, by applying perturbation directly to uh, uh, original inputs, we can get adversarial inputs for models with continuous inputs like speech. Um, but for models with discrete inputs like tests, the perturbation probably will not lead to a legal input. So we use the nearest one as the input after searching along the perturbations. Finally, these adversarial inputs will be evaluated with model performance and coverage to help later testing. In this paper, we also designed two novel metrics, hidden states coverage and self states coverage. Uh, when to predict the next word following A, the hidden states units will be mapped to a list of candidates. Uh, if uh, a hidden state unit is the maximum, its mapped, mapped candidate will be probably be the uh, predicted result. So we define hidden state coverage to mirror each hidden, unit state, hidden state unit whether it's used for prediction. And we also define cell state coverage to mirror each cell state unit is whether it's for contact pre preserving in different degrees. For evaluation, we select four models, including three sequence to sequence models and one classification model. The first three are of uh, LSTM structure. Uh, I mean, a CLU GRU model is an image classification model of CRU structure. Finally, this uh, LSTM is for comparison to other RNA testing works. Over the test, testing models, RNA test outperforms FGSM and DL first, reducing the model performance more sharply with higher success rate. And for other RNA testing works, RNA test achieves higher adversarial rate than test RNN. And for deep stellar, we achieve the more perplexity with higher generation rate. And then for coverage guidance, we found that coverage guidance could produce different perturbations with other methods. And then state coverage guidance could generate adversarial inputs and perform neuron coverage guidance, whether independently or jointly with adversarial research. Uh, finally, here are sample adversarial inputs on PTB model. Uh, our adversarial map inputs result in the model assembly worth further from semantics and ge generating text of higher perplexity. Finally, the conclusions. Uh, that's all. You could check the paper and the media for more details. And welcome for more discussions via emails. Thank you. Thank you, Jianmen. Um, the next paper is Adaptive Test Selection for Deep Neural Networks by Xinyu Gao. Hello, everyone. <coughs> Hello, everyone. My name is Gao Xunyu from Nanjing University in China. Today, I will briefly introduce our paper, Adaptive Test Selection for Deep Neural Networks. We are entering the area of deep learning. Deep neural networks have been deployed in many fields. DNA-driven software, essentially it's one kind of software program, could also suffer from software defects that may cause huge losses. Therefore, the requirements for quality assurance techniques have become exceedingly demanded. In practice, developers often retrain the DNA model with rich data to fix the incorrect behaviors. They need to collect many data and hire a large workforce to label them. Therefore, identifying and selecting the most representative data become critical. There are two families of test selection techniques. Courage-guided test selection and prioritization test selection. However, both of them have limitations. Therefore, we propose our method ATS. The overview of ATS is as follows. First, for given test inputs, 
we obtain the output vector of a net neural network. Next, we propose a mapping relationship, which converts the output domain into a set of intervals to describe the fault pattern. Finally, we propose a fitness metric and select tests based on the fitness value. We use a five-step process to calculate. In the first step, we cluster the test data based on its prediction category. This step ensures that we can analyze test cases with similar results. Next, we construct an index set for each test case in cluster. Each element in set represents the local domain. Step three is project operation. We project our output vector onto the plane and get the local information by prime. Step four is extend operation. In this step, we extend the subspace vector by prime to an interval. As shown in the picture, we determine the intersection point by extending LY by prime to LPLQ. The local fault pattern is designed as a segment GK. The length is determined by the uncertainty. In the last step, we collect all local patterns from its local domain as its fault pattern. Before test selection process, we, didn't, we need to know how to calculate the fault pattern of our test site. For each cluster, we take the union of all corresponding local fault patterns under each local domain. With the help of fault pattern, we propose a fitness metric that assesses the difference between test case and the selected test site. We divided the whole selection procedure in two parts, cluster by cluster selection and total selection. Generally, we select the test case with higher fitness value in each cluster. If the candidate site is unbalanced, we select the rest part based on the fitness value or uncertainty. We experiment ATS with four models and four data sites. The baseline selection methods are divided in two types. We choose four typical techniques for each step. In ARC-1, we compare the average for the detection rate between ATS and baseline methods. The coverage guided test selection methods have a poor performance, while most prioritization methods perform better. ATS has the best result in most combinations. In ARC-2, ATS achieved the best results for selecting diverse faults in all combinations where prioritization methods are sometimes even worse than random. This phenomenon means that, although prioritization methods can sometimes detect more faults, the test case, case, cases selected may have an uneven distribution. In ARC-3, we evaluated the effectiveness of retraining the DNA model with selected test cases. Only in a few configurations, there are some prioritization methods that show similar performance to ATS. Such a result supports our assumption that instead of selecting more faults with less diversity, ATS could select a subset with enough faults with more four types, which is more effective to enhance the DNA model. We summarize the advantages of our method ATS. First, ATS could adaptively determine which test in the candidate set is more suitable to be labeled manually. Next, ATS could select a test site with enough and diverse faults. Finally, ATS could optimize the DNA model with a much lower labeling cost. That's all for our presentation. Thank you for your attention and please feel free to ask questions. Thank you, Shenyu. Uh, can you all hear me? Okay, all right. Uh, so the next paper, is uh, evaluating and improving neural program smoothing based fuzzing, and it will be presented by Ming Yuan Wu. Uh, yes. Can you see my screen now? Yes. Okay. So, hello, everyone. Today, our presentation is about evaluating and improving neural program smoothing based fuzzing. My name is Ming-Yuan Wu, and uh, I'm a PhD candidate under the University of Hong Kong and Sustet Zhang PhD program, supervised by Professor Yuxin Zhang from Sustet and Professor Yu Heming Chui from Hong Kong U. And overall, there are two existing fuzzes about neural programs in space fuzzing, uh, neural uh, news and antifuzz. And here's the framework for news and antifuzz. 
So under each iteration, they train neural network models use existing seeds from C Coopers. And know that new news and antifas adopt different neural network models. News adopt a single layer free forward network, while antifas adopt a two additional tasks. The approach sensitive edge coverage and the context sensitive edge coverage to construct a multi task neural network model for smooth program and further guiding the fuzzing. So after obtaining the neural network models, news and antifas randomly select a deterministic number of the seed and the explore edges. For each selected seed, they calculate the gradients of the selected edges vector with respect to all the bytes. And use the antifas mutate the most promising byte to generate mutants by shorting the gradient. And we can see this, this, uh, this component are antifas only. Now, since news and antifas only adopted 10 popular real world projects in their evaluation, we raised our first research question that how do news and antifas perform on a large scale data set? And meanwhile, the effect of the key components in news and antifas, for example, gradient guidance, the models, mutation strategies were not discussed before. Then our second research question is how do the key component of news and antifas affect edge exploration? And we have multiple important findings after evaluating news and antifas. And the first finding is according to the evaluation of a large scale benchmark shoot with a total of 28 real world projects, the performance of news and antifas can be largely program dependent. Interestingly, such programs with space fuzzers tend to perform better on larger programs. And the second finding is that randomly selecting bytes for mutation dominates the efficiency of edge exploration among all the study fuzzing strategies, indicating that it is promising to augment edge exploration by adopting random bias selection mechanism. And the third finding is that also the gradient guidance mechanism adopted by news and antifas are overall effective. Uh, but their performance can be rather unstable on some programs. And the first finding is personally, I think it is the most important finding, is that different neural network models have limited impact on the effectiveness on program smooth space fuzzing. So inspired by our findings, we propose pre fuzz which is probability resource efficient program smooth space fuzzing to enhance the work. So here's the framework of, for our approach. We first, first train a neural network model by applying all the existing seed as a training set. And next, we first adopt a resource efficient edge selection mechanism, which is designed for identifying the edge worth being explored to select edges for gradient computation. Then the gradient information is utilized to generate mutants for fuzzing. Meanwhile, prefers adopt probability by selection mechanism, that is to say PBS here, to facilitate the mutations. And the, uh, then we have a mutants, and if such mutant uh, explore new coverage, it will use to update the C Coopers. And the evaluation results demonstrate that we first can significantly outperform news by 43.1% and any first by 45.2% in terms of edge coverage. And here is our conclusion. First, we have a data set, including 28 real world projects that can be used as the benchmarks for future research on fuzzing. And second, we conduct an extensive study of news and antifas on the large scale benchmark shoot with detailed inspection of both their strengths and limitations. And so we have a technical improvement with us, uh, which combines a resource efficient edge selection mechanism and a probability bias selection mechanism, which can outperform the state of the art significantly. And so we also have some critical guidelines. Actually, it is four. The first one is that the simplicity neural network models may suffice. And second, we have to think twice before applying dynamic analysis. And next, uh, edge selection, yes, gradient computation may be. Actually, we can see from uh, the approach that gradient is only used to score the byte to find the promising byte. And at last, according to our findings, we suggest that users to design such probability search strategy with more guidance to any of their adoptive fathers when possible. Thank you. That will be all. Thank you so much, Ming Yuan. Uh, okay. Our final paper presentation is uh, Muffin Testing Deep Learning Libraries via Neural Architecture Fuzzing, and it will be presented by Jia Zen Gu.
Uh, hello everyone, I'm Jia Zhen from Fudan University, and today I will introduce our work, Muffin Testing Deep Learning Libraries via Neural Architecture Fuzzing. Let me introduce the background first. A deep learning system typically consists of three main components, the source program, the library, and the infrastructure. Bugs can appear at any level, and bugs in their libraries may cause unexpected outputs. And our work focuses on testing DL libraries. Previous DL library testing methods use either existing models or mutated ones as test inputs. However, such model cannot cover most APIs in DL libraries. In addition, these methods only detect bugs in the model inference phase. They detect the inconsistent model outputs of different libraries. Uh, and our target is to exercise more DL library functions and detect bugs in the model training phase, which are not covered by existing methods. As a testing work, there are two main challenges, how to obtain the test cases and how to obtain test oracle. To tackle the challenge of test cases, we propose a DAG-based model generation algorithm to generate diverse models from scratch so as to cover diverse DL library APIs. For the challenge of test oracle, we propose a set of metrics based on data trace analysis. These metrics can measure the inconsistency in model training phase. Based on these metrics, we can adopt differential testing to detect training related bugs. This, uh, this figure presents the overview of our tool, Muffin. It contains two main parts, the model generation part and the inconsistency detection part. In the model generation part, Muffin divides the model architecture into two phases, the in, in structure information and the layer information, and it generates models from scratch. In the inconsistency detection part, Muffin detects inconsistency in three different stages of model training. The four the loss calculation and the backward calculation. In the model generation part, Muffin first generates the structure information. It describes how layers are connected. Muffin adopts two model structure templates and uses a DAG to represent the structure information. Then Muffin generates the layer information, which describes the specific layer types in a model. Combining the structure information and the layer information, the model architecture can be obtained. Finally, Muffin uses different libraries to generate DL models. During the model generation, Muffin can detect crash bugs. Then, in inconsistency detection part, Muffin participates the model training into three different stages. In the forward calculation stage, Muffin detects layer output inconsistency and crash bugs. In loss calculation stage, Muffin detects the loss value inconsistency as well as the crash bugs. In backward calculation, Muffin detects the gradient incon uh, inconsistency. Uh, in order to accurately detect inconsistency, we use the Chebyshev dist distance to eliminate the inference of tensor shapes, and we use the difference changes between two consecutive layers to mitigate the impact of normal effects such as floating point deviation. In the evaluation, Muffin detects 18 bugs in the latest version of three popular, popular DL libraries, TensorFlow, Cyano, and CNTK. In addition, Muffin also detects 21 crash bugs in these libraries. For more details and the more experimental results, Please refer to our paper and the GitHub homepage. Thank you so much, Jia Zin. Uh, let's uh, give a round of applause to all the presenters. <laughs> there are these really cool emoticons on the bottom of your screen that you can use if you want. So uh, I was going to say, that for questions, you have two options. Either you can raise your hand and then I will call in the order you've raised your hand. 
uh, and the, we will go through the questions. You switch, please switch on your microphone and if you want your video when you ask your question, or you can uh, uh, type out your question in the chat window and I will read out those questions as well. I'm not able to see all the participants in one row, so forgive me if I haven't noticed your question. Are there any questions for our paper press uh, paper presenters? I see David put up his hand and Stefan did. I, I I meant that there's a raise hand functionality in the chat window that you can use. Yeah, when I click on raise hands, it didn't work for me. It showed something with a backstage is not available, which is why I so use physical. Ah, okay. <laughs> All right. Sorry about that. Uh, so I will obviously uh, then if that's the case, I would say um, if I can see you on video, I will call on you once you raise your hand, obviously. But otherwise, uh, you can turn on your microphone and start asking the question. You can also type out your question in the chat window. So I saw David's hand first, and then I will go with Stefan, whose hand I saw. And anyone else, if you have a question after, please feel free, free to switch on your microphone and ask the question. Yes, Stefan. So first of all, thanks for your presentation. It was a really good paper. I really enjoyed your presentation. I have a, a question for you, Stefan. So uh, I'm not an expert on uh, smoky tests. I don't know what they are. Uh, the question is uh, on whether those tests have been developed uh, according specifically to the models that have been uh, tested or not. So for instance, I don't know, you can have night base and you can know that night base is sensible to some aspects and then you push on this direction. Then you have random forest, you know that it doesn't work well with, I don't know, outliers of a specific case and then you go to, so this is somehow the question. Um, yes, thank you um, for the question and also your nice words. Um, basically, no. Um, we just sat down and thought which is data that can be problematic. And then afterwards, we went to, uh, we looked at which algorithms could we test. And then we thought, okay, let's take clustering classification, fairly simple, um, because if we would include regression, for example, we won't need to add additional considerations for the dependent variable because um, it's then again, something continuous, which would make it more difficult. So um, and then we just said, okay, let's not use anything, but let's use mature software, latest versions and see if it works there. And the only restriction we then built in algorithm specific is that if we knew that an algorithm doesn't support certain inputs. So for example, a multinomial knife base doesn't support negative values. Then we did not generate tests, test cases that contain negative values. Um, to well remove some noise from our data for the analysis. I have just a follow-up question, just a clarification. You say that you started from problematic data. Mm -hmm. And this is the point. How did you come up with something that you believe is problematic? Um, basically, we use this idea of what are extreme distributions. So what are known extreme distributions? So extremely large values, extremely small values, split between training and test data that you have an extreme concept drift, skews, um, constant values, um, large numbers of categories. Um, and then for these, we considered also different uh, ranges. So floating point 32-bit uh, arithmetic, 34-bit arithmetics, and for example, with 32-bit arithmetics, everything worked. And once we went to 64 bits, then we found problems. Um, yeah, so basically it was more or less a thought experiment to get to these test cases. Thank, Thank you, you, Stefan. Stefan, did you have a question? I saw uh, you raise Yes, actually uh, two. So um, first thing is to let's stick with the testing and then I have also one uh, for David. Um, so for the other uh, presentations, um, they were all on testing um, and finding bugs in deep learning frameworks. Mm -hmm. and. Um, Basically, my question is, um, sometimes you reported you found bugs. Um, did you report those bugs to the libraries and how did the developers react to what you did? Because when we reported this, they were sometimes a bit skeptical and sometimes they were more or less enthusiastic about it. Uh, sometimes even for similar problems, one developer was like, yay, and the other was like, mm. so uh, 
did you have any is an experience with the developers there uh, okay so uh, i i can share my my experience on reporting bugs to the library developers and uh, we we testing three frameworks and uh, uh, the cntk developer just uh, do not reply to our uh, issue report and uh, the, since uh, the ciano is uh, just stop developing uh, but the tensorflow as uh, they they are more active i think it, it depends on how the framework is on the developer and uh, uh, and i think you should maybe uh, you should provide more details to help the developers to uh, reproduce the bugs uh, because we we uh, because uh, our issue report included the test cases and uh, we manually check the uh, source code and uh, we tell them we think that the bug uh, lies in these codes so i think such can help them to identify the bugs more rapidly. Thank you. Any Details other comments? Have similar experiences? Okay, um, then uh, maybe my question uh, to David. So we also did a lot of work in recent years to clean uh, defect prediction data, find out the impact of different types of noise. And uh, I really loved your paper when I read it first. Um, so first of all, really thank you for that work. Um, and I also like the recommendation, let's just drop uh, the last release. Um, so my question is basically, how can we, when we drop the last release already, um, how can we accurately identify then the quality of our models? Um, when, for example, I want to establish a defect prediction model somewhere and I know I cannot use my data from the last release. And then I need to use relatively old data already for training. And my question is then validation then gets really hard at some point, right? Yes. So I think there are two different scenarios. I think that there is a scenario where you are in practice. So you are building a, a real machine learning model that wants to read something for the future. And so in this case, reasonably, you have uh, the training data from now to the past, I don't know, five years, last year, whatever. And uh, so in this case, it doesn't make sense to waste to remove the last half percent of the data because you know size matters and the more data that, and the better there is also another point that uh, there is a study about uh, jit predictions that says that uh, uh, the last data is the best data because it's more similar to the actual process if you use data that uh, that is 10 years ago then it's not relevant for the prediction anymore so there is a trade-off between having fresh data that is relevant, but also measure enough that uh, we have bugs. Uh, to answer your question, there is another scenario that is for researchers like us that needs to know if random forest is better than whatever, and we have to change the features and we do other stuff and we do the validation and we look at the results. Well, in this case, we, we can put ourselves in the past and we can say what would have happened if we would to use this uh, prediction model, I don't know, five years ago. And so we could remove the last five years of data because we can move in time in the back somehow. And so we remove the snoring problem. And this is something that makes a lot of sense. Uh, but uh, I think the, something that is fascinating is that there is a trade-off also in this case, that there is other noise in the data. So whatever you use, you know, uh, you cover a spot and then there is another spot that you need to cover. But uh, in practice, when you just want to validate from a point of view of researchers and of practitioners, then it always makes sense to review to remove at least the half of the data if time matters, of course. And in our context, time matters because we predict by releases. Yeah. Yeah, there's also um, 
the other paper from, I think it was from Shane McIntosh a couple of years ago on the impact of ignoring the uh, uh, timing impact. And I think there's also a later one, that, so they did it for just some time. I think there's a later one that also considers this for release level defect prediction. So I, I guess your approach also directly helps to avoid these, uh, let's say, information leaks due to ignoring time constraints. Yes, yes. But they, in Macintosh and other paper, they saw that uh, the more uh, close is the data that you use in training, the better it is. Whereas I see that uh, the closest data is the worst data because it's full of noise. Yeah. So, yeah. But this is good because, you know, mm. there are pros and cons in everything. Thank you, David. Uh, are there any other questions? Uh, I have a question for me when I'm interested in your work and my question is when for your edge selection because there are so many possible edges in DNA models how do you filter or se select them? Oh okay thank you so first I, I want just want to clarify that also neural programs with fuzzing is based on neural neural network however it is to testing the binary program the targeting panel oh, okay, okay. your network to approximate the branching behavior for binary program and the edge here it is not the model's edge it is oh, actually the division between the basic block yes yes thank you very much okay you're welcome thank you uh any other questions If not, I have, I have a question for the authors of the Muffin paper, so Giazen and others. Uh, so I was I have a couple of questions. I'll just club them together so you can answer. So my first question was, do you detect any other bugs besides crash bugs? And the second was, what is the overhead in gathering traces and whether the times you reported included that overhead? Okay, so the first first question is, uh, despite the crash bugs, uh, because we use the te differential testing, so we can compare the outputs of different uh, libraries, and uh, we manually check uh, if the outputs of libraries are different from the other one, and we will manually identify which function causes the bug, and we manually check if the implementation has bugs. So we uh, actually we find uh, we find the bugs in the uh, forward calculation, backward calculation, loss calculation. All three stages have bugs. We our tool can find, and uh, the performance. Uh, our paper has a performance comparison um, because because we use data uh, data analysis uh, traces. So it uh, our tool. Uh, uh, the execution time of our tool is about 10, 10 more minutes than previous previous approaches, but uh, our our tool can detect more bugs in the training phase. So we think it's a it's a reasonable overhead, and uh, and because we uh, actually our tool can uh, do not require a real data set to train the model, so. Actually, we can just use a uh, random generated vectors or tensors as inputs, but we compare with previous work for uh, with the real data sets. So we okay. think the overhead is reasonable. Okay, thank you. Actually, I have uh, some questions for Jamie. Uh, your paper RNN test, I think. Uh, the adversarial uh, training is um, a method to focus, uh, the target is to improve the model's robustness and uh, avoid the adversarial inputs. So do you evaluate after retraining with your generated adversarial inputs, uh, does the robustness of the model improve or, and uh, if you use other something like black box, black box uh, adversarial attack methods, 
uh, can it pro, uh, pro improve the model's robustness? Okay, thank you for a question. Uh, uh, actually, we have did uh, we have done the advisor training in our work uh, since the time uh, time time uh, time limit. Uh, we uh, I haven't reported this in, uh, previously. Uh, uh, over PTB model, I have uh, incorporated adversarial inputs to the training set. And we found that the train, train perplexity increase and the valid perplexity and text perplexity after training also declined. And that's, uh, that means that we have improved the model uh, performance. And for the black, black box uh, adversarial inputs generation techniques, we haven't used that. We, we are uh, white box uh, adversarial input generation. Um, I think that uh, black box testing method also could generate adversarial inputs and, and these adversarial inputs are also uh, mm, cap capable to improve the model. Okay, thank you. Yeah, welcome. Any other questions? Okay, uh, while people are thinking about questions, I can go through my list of questions for the different papers. Um, so I have a question for David. What I know you've said you you do test defect predictions, um, but I was wondering if you know what type of defects fall uh, and their criticality. Did you assess the defect types? No. So what uh, we did in this paper, which is uh, the thing that uh, we did in the past, is that we just uh, uh, mined the Jira repository. So first of all, uh, we we trust uh, the developers who label it uh, defects as defects and non-defects as non-defects. And second, uh, we didn't uh, compare uh, the, the impact of, uh, so we didn't assess the impact of the snoring of the uh, severity uh, of the defects to our uh, results. Um, but uh, it might have no impact in the sense that uh, if uh, defect uh, sleep, then they should sleep regardless of their severity level, or maybe not. This could be an interesting research direction. So we can see whether how many release defects that have low severity slept versus uh, defects that have a high severity. Thank and you. also the severity type might change over time as well. It depends. Um, oh, all right. <laughs> yes, yeah, Stefan. Um, maybe as a follow-up to that, um, so this, since you use the issue types from uh, the Jura from Apache, um, they are about 40% of the time wrong. So uh, we ha that was a finding by Herzig in 2013, and uh, we recently replicated it. So about 40% of these issue types that are labeled as bugs are actually, well, most often they're feature requests, but also other changes. Um, so yes, this so, actually means you also have that... dormant features in there. But <laughs> so, what would be a yes. dormant feature? I, can, I try to imagine that right now. <laughs> yes, if I can follow up, uh, I don't know. I mean, in, in, there could be a vision in which we need to serve the developers. And so, if the developer says there is an issue, whether the issue is a bug, is a feature, or something in between, there is still something that needs to be found, right, and inspected. And so maybe this uh, noise of features versus bug in the classification in Jira, it doesn't really impact uh, the practical value of the research because at the end it's still something that works. Uh, but I do understand your point. Well, uh, regarding the practical value, it depends a bit. If you say we can save costs by uh implementing features earlier, then yes, if you say we can save costs by preventing bugs in, pre 
going into production, then uh, you cannot save costs by accidentally predicting features in these models. So this noise can have a big impact on the cost perspective. Yes, but you know that the difference between bug and feature is, uh, you know, there are fuzzy boundaries, right? And at the end, uh, you know, but yes, so I understand your point. It, it was just a discussion, yes. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? Okay, I have a question for Shinyu, who's the author of the Adaptive Test Selection for Deep Neural Networks paper. Um, I was just uh, wondering if, so you consider mutations in input data. So the test selection technique that you've proposed, is it capable of finding faults in the uh, model architecture? So I was just the mutations that you have. Do you what types of faults does it cover? Uh, can you speak slowly? Sorry. Uh, and I was just wondering if your test selection mechanism is capable of uncovering faults in the DNN architecture, rather than simply the input data. Uh, I can type out my question if that's easier. Uh, okay, okay. You can just type it out. Sorry, sorry. I need some time to think, think a moment, and then I will answer your questions. Yeah, no problem. Just answer in the chat. Um, um, uh, the DNA the article is, uh, the, DN, the fourth in DNA, um, we defined in our paper is uh, use, the, use, use the data mutation and, uh, and to find the, um, the faults. Uh, in in practice, we often often collect data and uh, use the data to test uh, the DN the DN behaviors. Um, we define the fault uh, default uh, based on the uh, based on the data. If if the data if the DN predict the data and uh, give a wrong label, and we 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 think it's a it's a it's a fault. Mm. Okay. And the the DNA has many neurons and many uh, and many connections. So we can we cannot uh, uh, operate the DNA article directly. Mm. We on we we in practice we usually use the many data to retrain the DNA and uh, fix uh, we fix their behaviors. I see. So the faults could be in the architecture or the input data. You don't know. Um, I I don't uh, uh, I don't understand the fault uh, in the article, not in in data. The, the uh, what's the meaning is it? It could be that um, the architecture, as in the activation functions you used, uh, the layers or the connections or your loss function, oh. any of those could have. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Um, our 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 technique uh, uh, application uh, application application scenario is that we have a pre pre trained model, and the model is deployed in uh, maybe the model is deployed in the real world. Um, 
because because we don't our our technique don't involve the the detail of the DNA article. Uh, so so our 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 technique can detect faults in in data, not not uh, DNA article. Yes, oh. such as um, uh, active function.